Numbers uh, chapter 22, and we will continue this evening in our series on good examples of bad examples. And so I'm looking forward to being in this portion of the scripture tonight. Numbers chapter 22, if you will, please. This is one of those kindergarten stories or Sunday school stories. Balaam and the donkey. Remember that? Well, Numbers chapter 22. And uh, we will uh, we'll begin for our text tonight. We will just read a couple of verses. And then we're going to pray for the Lord to help us. And then we'll get just, just follow the story. And we'll look at why Balaam was a good example of a bad example. Okay, so in verse uh, 2 of Numbers chapter 22, the Bible says, And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel, and Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Baor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me, this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail that we may smite them and that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot that he from that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. And we will pray and ask the Lord's help from there, shall we? Father, please help us with our understanding of the Scripture tonight. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to find from simple statements in the Scripture exactly what you said and exactly what we're to glean. And God, I just ask that we would be warned of the sin of Balaam. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of y'all remember this Sunday school story? Remember the... Did anybody have felt illustrations with this one? You know, you had the angel, the big long sword that was like as long as Goliath's sword. Angels don't carry normal sized swords. Their swords are like, you know, Jedi swords. They just go way out. You know, so you got an angel and he's got a big sword and he's holding it with both hands, right? Isn't that how he's holding it in the picture? I have to do some research on this. I'm just going on my memory. And I think I'm right because I can remember things from a long time ago, but I can't remember things like from this afternoon. So, like, for instance, I don't know who you people are. So, <laughs> uh, but, you know, he's got a big long sword. And he's wielding it, and there's a couple of rocks that Balaam is passing through. You know, like the big round rocks. And I think they stole the rocks from the tomb picture, the garden tomb picture, because they look the same as those rocks. You know, this, the, the round rock, you know, and it's not one of the flat rocks like, you know, what they just slide along the little thing to cover the door. It's a round rock, as in a ball shaped rock. You got one here, and you got a smaller one here, but you also have like a precipice that this rock is on the edge of. And so the donkey has to pass through this little gap. And here's the angel. And he's got a big sword. And you got Balaam on the donkey. And you have Balaam, I think he had a stick, but he might have just been punching his donkey. That I don't remember specifically. But Balaam's riding on the donkey. And you know, that's the picture in my mind, at least from the felt presentation or from the curriculum that I took in kindergarten. I was taught it in Sunday school. And I was also taught it in the kindergarten, I did notice as a child the discrepancy between the locations uh, because it looked like they were drawn differently or painted differently. I think one was painted, the other was put up on felt. You know, Sunday school teachers, you got a tough job. You really do. Because what people are impressed by, what people actually glean from what you say and what you teach is actually not really anything to do <laughs> with the point that you're usually trying to teach. So here's the point that I learned from Balaam's donkey. The donkey talked. It was like Mr. Ed, you know. Uh, 
a donkey can't talk, of course, of course, unless, of course, the donkey is, of course, a donkey belonging to Balaam, I think is how the song goes. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so the donkey spoke to Balaam. Balaam hit the donkey. And that's what I remember, pretty much. Why did you hit me? And then the answer is, well, because there was an angel standing there, and he would have killed you, except that I saved your life. And then Balaam hugged his donkey, and they became fast friends forever. <laughs> End of story. And they lived happily ever after, I think. Something like that. Okay. Now, I'm being a little bit silly, but that's about all I remember from learning about Balaam as a kid. How about you? Now, I know there are probably some intelligent people here that got the point, and you knew what the sin of Balaam was, and you knew what Balaam did wrong, but that's what I remember learning. Now, I'm not saying that's what my teachers taught. I'm just telling you that's what I remember learning, the story of Balaam. I remember the illustrations. I remember the angel. I remember the donkey, and I remember the donkey talked, and Balaam wasn't surprised that the donkey talked, but he was happy that he didn't get killed. End of story. And that really isn't anything that has much to do with the story at all. Of course, I think it's interesting, don't you, that Balaam didn't say, since when do you talk to his donkey? When his donkey said, why are you beating me? He said, if I had a sword, I'd kill you. <laughs> He'd raise it, I'd run you through. You know, I wouldn't just beat you. He didn't say, what? Since when do you learn how to talk? So here's some extra for you. You ready? You ready to have some fun? There's nowhere in the Bible that says that this isn't the first time Balaam's donkey talked. It may have been like a talking donkey and talked all the time. <laughs> so that's not anywhere. There's nowhere in the Bible that says that isn't true. Nowhere it says it is. It's just extra for you. If you want to take something home that has nothing to do with anything, there you go. Because <clears throat> really, that whole story, as we tell it, isn't the point, is it, of the Scripture. In other words, you ask yourself the question, the practical question about Balaam. Everybody knows about Balaam and his donkey, right? If you have the Bible trivia game, that's another place it's, it's uh, painted at. We had, when I was growing up, a Bible trivia game, and there was, uh, on the board, I, if I remember right, a picture of Balaam and his donkey. And that's one of the questions was about Balaam and his donkey. So if you have the Bible trivia game or anything like that, you really take home the story of Balaam and his donkey. But let me just tell you something. Just remind you about something. Do you know this? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And I'll be quite truthful with you, if that's the story of Balaam and the donkey, there really literally is about as much help there as there is from watching Mr. Ed. How many of you guys don't know who Mr. Ed is? This whole world. Julio, can you believe this? What, what has become of this generation? Well, how many of y'all... You're old. <laughs> You're getting old. Okay, forget... I'm not even going to tell you who Mr. Ed is. I should not have to educate you about 1950s era uh, television. Okay. It's not my job as your pastor, so forget it. You don't need to know. All right. Too bad. Was that a wholesome show? Lady, you don't know who Mr. Ed was? Yeah, oh, you do. Yeah. Was that a pretty wholesome show? Was it mean bad about it? I, I don't know. I only it was too boring to watch more than once, too. right? Yeah. Yeah, it was funny. Like the first episode you watched, and after that, it was like the same thing. Yeah. So that's all I remember about it. Okay, but I. All right, moving on. Let's illustrate it this way The story of Balaam and his donkey has about as much point to it as a show you've never watched. <laughs> because the Bible says that there are things that we're supposed to learn from every bit of Scripture and that we can be helped by. The Bible says it's profitable. All Scripture, the Bible says, and this is true, all Scripture is profitable for doctrine. That's teaching. You can learn things for reproof. You can be literally shown that the way that you're going is wrong for correction. You can be shown how to get right, be corrected. And for instruction in righteousness, you can be educated to live in a way that pleases God from anything that's in the Scripture. That's what the Bible says. And my question is, based on that story, if that's the moral, 
if that's the absolute end of it, what can we learn? You know, don't ride a talking donkey to the wrong place. How do you know what the right and the wrong place is? See, that isn't the point of the scripture. That's my that's my whole point. Wasting all that much time. You guys get it? Okay. But here's the thing. Here's the deal. Based on the number of mentions that Balaam is used as a good example of a bad example, I'm not sure that in the whole Bible there is as anyone there is anyone as popular as Balaam being used for a good example of a bad example. I mean, the guy's mentioned. He's not an Israelite. He's he's just a guy that you know. He's he's not a mysterious figure um, like, for instance, uh, Melchizedek. He's just a man that is known that God speaks to him and that when he blesses someone, they're blessed, and when he curses someone, they're cursed. And that's interesting, but it really is not that extraordinary. It's not, it's not something all that special. And yet he is mentioned throughout the Scripture over and over and over again as a type of wicked. He's mentioned in Jude. He's mentioned in Revelation. He's mentioned in 2 Peter. His sin is mentioned in the New Testament. And he's an obscure nobody, actually, in the Old Testament. He's not in the lineage of Christ. He's not an example of anything good. He's actually one of the very best examples, good examples of a bad example in the whole of Scripture. And a lot of people don't really know what he did that was bad. Do you? Don't say it if you do, because you'll spoil the ending for me. Okay? But do you? That's a good question, isn't it? If Balaam is mentioned so many times in the Scripture, and I mean he really is. This guy's talked about. He's talked about over and over and over again. There are people that did amazing things and they're just like mentioned as a blurb. Like, psh, there he is and he's gone. You just hear a mention of a guy one time and that's it. And he's never mentioned again anywhere else in the Scripture. But this is a guy that literally impacted Israeli way of thinking and became the Benedict Arnold, if you will, for Israel. Y'all don't know who Benedict Arnold is. Brother Matt, you do, right? Okay, thank you. Because you went to school, and in your school they didn't educate you about Mr. Ed, but they did give you history. So, yeah, you, you know, I had one of those too. So I know. Thank you, brother, for being educated about Benedict. How many of y'all know who Benedict Arnold is? Oh, my goodness. All right. I got to just stop with the... You never feel less relevant. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> Let's get to the Scripture. Just move on from that. Alright. So what did Balaam do? Well, he was known that he could bless things and he could curse things. And the truth is, is that that's, in, that's incredible, that's impressive, but it's not so amazing when you have a Bible full of people like that, right? In other words, nothing stands out about a guy's ability to bless and to curse when you literally have a scripture full of it. And matter of fact, when you compare Elijah's ability, you know, Elijah said, Lord, three years, no rain. It didn't rain for three years. And he said, God, make it rain. And it rained. Elijah called down fire from heaven. Uh, to You know, I mean, there's no comparison, right? With Elijah and, and Balaam. So Balaam, he did speak for God. He's summoned by a fellow, and I confuse his name sometimes, I, when, especially when I'm talking fast or thinking uh, or, or moving too fast without thinking specifically the names. The king that tried to hire Balaam was Balak. So Balak uh, hired Balaam, and their names have kingly significance, and really it's not the point of the passage of Scripture. But in verse 9, the Bible says, oh, I'm sorry, in verse 8, after the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian had come and tried to hire him to curse Israel. Verse 9, the Bible says, And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, 
Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse thee them, and peradventure I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. So, we could say, on the basis of the conversation between God and between Balaam, that at this stage of the game, Balaam's fairly innocent, isn't he? I, we, without question, recognize that he has a relationship of some kind with God. Balaam is in contact with God. God speaks to him. He speaks to God. And that's special, isn't it? I'm not, being, I'm not saying that sarcastically. I'm saying it seriously. Remember, no sarcasm at all this year from me. So you don't have to like look for a double entendre or uh, any kind of extra meaning. I'm not being sarcastic. He really has something special with God. And in verse 11, he explained, he said, Behold, there's a people come out of Egypt which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure I shall be able to come and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them, thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. Now there's a doctrine there, isn't there? God has a blessing for His people, national Israel. And uh, there, that is not uh, in, the, in the grammar, even in the Hebrew grammar, that is not something that has an ending to it, as far as, you know, God's people are blessed until. No, God says they are blessed. Now you'll see throughout the Scripture from this point moving forward many times when God judges His people, but that has nothing to do with what God has said about Israel. And if you disagree with that today, my friend, I'm sorry for you, but you're, you are in disagreement with God. There's a lot of uh, rampant anti-Semitism in the world today, and there's way more than there ought to be among believers which is to say that any believer who knows God ought to know that God's chosen people, according to the flesh, are blessed. Now, we recognize that God has set them aside for a time. We've seen that so many times in the Scripture. That's indisputable. But the notion that there isn't something special about national Israel from God's perspective is ludicrous. God's people are blessed. My personal policy when it comes to dealings with God's people according to the flesh is err on the side of being, you know, of, of the folks that are blessed. And it doesn't mean that they, what they do is right. It doesn't mean that I agree with them, but I'm not going to be against God's people. Israel, let somebody else fill that role if they'd like to. God says they're blessed to Balaam. That's a help. Okay, so practically speaking, I'll ask the kids this one because I know they know the answer. Kids, if God said don't go and curse the Israelites because they're blessed, what should Balaam try to do against them? God said don't do it. What should he do? What should he say it? Nothing. Nothing. The man ought to say, I can't do anything. Uh, leave me alone. Matter of fact, that's kind of what Balaam said. Look at verse 13. Balaam rose up in the morning and said to the princes of Balaam, Get you into your land. <laughs> like that. Get you into your land. For the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose up and they went into Balak and said, Balaam refuseth to come with us. <laughs> so, I love the phrase, get you. He said, go home. I'm not doing anything for you. And at this stage of the game, Balaam's, he's doing fine, isn't he? He's doing fine. Here's where we begin to see a good example of a bad example. There is a difference between obedience by action and obedience with a heart of agreement. There is a difference. Have you ever, because of position, made the determination that this isn't the way that I think this should be done, or this isn't the way that if I were responsible and answerable for it, that I would do this, but because it's not my position to call the shots or make the decision, I'm going to go along with the program? I have. I try being an assistant to any pastor. I was. One of the best things for me, I thought, and I was advised by preachers before I became uh, a senior pastor was go serve under a pastor and learn how learn how to obey so that you can learn how to lead. If you don't learn how to follow, you can't be a good leader. And so I remember specifically, I, I won't, but I could give you for instances of times when my pastor said, I want this to be done this way. 
And it was against my best judgment. And I literally thought, you know something? That's not the best way to do it, and I know it. And, I, you know, you have to wrestle with that. You have to ask the question, okay, should I do it, should I not do it? Well, if it's a matter of conscience, you can't do it. But most things you find out are just a matter of pride, most, more so than conscience. And I found that when I would obey, or that is, do what the pastor said the way he said to do it, I found that oftentimes it worked out better than I thought it would. And I found out that when I would obey wholeheartedly, that it just, oftentimes, God just blessed it. And it was just fantastic. And I learned a lot from it. I learned, one, you don't know everything. And two, I learned that God blesses obedience. He just blesses it. He honors it. Now here we see an example, and we're going to see it illustrated, of Balaam technically obeying. In other words, God said, you better not do that, Balaam. And Balaam said, okay, I can't do it, guys. Sorry. But he wanted to. And there's a big difference. It's a big difference. Matter of fact, Jesus addressed that difference, didn't He, in the Beatitudes? When He talked about the difference between a heart and an action. He talked about murder and hatred. And Jesus said, as far as I'm concerned, hatred and murder are the same thing because of the heart. He talked about adultery and He talked about lust. And Jesus said, as far as I'm concerned, adultery and lust are the same thing because of the heart. And so I think because of the level of fear that Balaam had, he complied with God saying, you better not do that, Balaam. You better not curse them. But inside, he wanted to. And as far as God's concerned, friend, I just want to be frank with you. Balaam was the same as if he'd cursed Israel, with the difference being that God didn't allow it. God wouldn't allow it. God said they're blessed. You can't curse someone God says are blessed. You cannot do so. Okay, let's look up further on. You'd think it'd be over, but Balak is uh, serious here. In verse 15, Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable then they, you remember, it was, was it Elisha or Elijah? It was Elijah, wasn't it? When they said, oh man of God, he said, if I be a man of God, they sent 50 messengers. If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and burn you up. <laughs> they got burned up. And they sent 50 more messengers. Same thing. The third guy's like, stop! <laughs> Please don't burn me. You know? Uh, well, this kind of reminds me of, except that Balak didn't quite, wasn't quite the, uh, you know, that was Elijah, right? Not Elisha. Boy, I mix those two guys up terribly. Elisha? It was Elisha? Thank you, Lee. Thanks for knowing that. I, I used to know it a few times. I forgot it several <laughs> as well. Okay, so uh, now Balak sent yet more princes, more and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam, said unto him, Thus saith Balak the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. Now notice that statement. Balaam sent, Balak sent more important people to ask Balak, more influential people. And the words he urged with were, don't let anything stop you. Now what does that interpreted mean? That means don't listen to God. That's what that means, right? Don't let anything hinder you from coming. Don't, don't, let, don't be stopped by anything. And what that means is don't let God stop you. And so, guess what he did? In uh, verse 17, they made offers. I'll promote thee unto very great honor. I'll do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, and curse this people. And Balaam answered and said if, uh, unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now analyze that statement. Is there anything wrong in that statement? On face value, there's nothing wrong with it, but actually when you analyze it carefully, there's a lot wrong with it. See, on the face value, he said, I can't do anything against... And, and you notice that he acknowledges, he said, against beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. But it's interesting because the word cannot 
is not a word of the will, it's a word of ability. And there's a difference, you see. Because the fact is that if he could, he would have. But he could not, you see. Friend, if you think regarding God in heaven, who looks at the heart and weighs that way more than he does actions, if you think there's a grand difference between what you would do if you could do and what you do not do because you cannot, you're mistaken. Because God knows what you'd do. He knows what you'd do. You ever wonder why God allowed it to get this to go this far? Say, many times from my foolish, weak perspective, I think in terms of smushing, you know, I think like ants, the analogy. Y'all ever, you know, catch an ant on the counter? I know it doesn't happen at your house, but they come from somewhere in our house. They got in my truck the other day. I looked at my coffee cup and there are ants climbing up it. I started going like this. It's sort of like playing the, the ant game on your cell phone. It's exactly like that. They made a game out of it. It's kind of fun. Ant, the ants go marching one by one. Smush, smush. The ants go marching one by one. Smush, smush. And that's it for the ants. I've never met... I know there are huge ants in other parts of the world, but in parts of the world I've inhabited, I've never met an ant that just a good doesn't do the deal for. And that's the way I would have dealt with Balaam. I'd have said, okay, Balaam, I've seen your heart. <laughs> but God, God's not like that. God's, God's more merciful. And uh, God, I believe, wanted to let Balaam be a good example of a bad example. And so he did. Okay, so in verse 20, God came to Balaam at night and said, If the men come to call thee... Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. Verse 19. Here's what Balaam said. Now, therefore, I pray you, tell ye also here this night that I may know what the Lord will say unto me. And God came unto Balaam at night and, and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up, go with them, and yet, yet the word which I shall say unto thee, thou shalt do. Okay. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. Okay, so now let me ask you a question. Did God tell Balaam he could go? Well, uh, kind of yes, kind of no, right? It's kind of confusing. See, God told Balaam, okay, go ahead and go with them, and what I tell you to do, you do. But before God did that, before God said that, Balaam said, hey, wait till morning and uh, let me check and then I'll see if I can go with you. In other words, we see more of this attitude of, if I can't, I can't. But if I can, if I could, I would. And it's becoming more evident from Balaam. Whereas God told Balaam, don't. And Balaam said, I can't. But he didn't say, I won't. And you know there's a big difference. You know there's a, there's a big difference in a believer's life if you battle temptation simply of a never, with a never attitude, versus a, I'm not supposed to do that attitude. There's just a big difference, isn't there? You know a tempter or temptress. A person who is trying to get someone to falter, fall, or fail. They can really sense that, can't they? We, we hardly talk about it like it's even wrong anymore, but drugs of any kind, legal or illegal. It's surprising to me how little inhibition there is with people. It's more a matter of questioning the consequence than it is questioning the inherent evil. And somebody's offered drugs, and you're like, well, you know, I could lose my job, so I won't do drugs. Or it's technically illegal, so I won't do it. But there's no moral inhibition. There's no, you know what, my body's a temple of the Holy Ghost. And for me to do that's evil, and I'm not going to. I don't care if it's legal or not. That has nothing to do with it. You ever hear somebody try to start the whole marijuana debate with you, and when they want to talk about marijuana, they say, well, you know, alcohol is legal. I say, well, let's start there. Let's go ahead and begin there. I don't think it ought to be. <laughs> it's a drug. You say, they say, alcohol is a drug. I say, yeah, it is. So I don't drink. 
Well, cigarettes are a drug. Yeah, they are. So I don't smoke. Okay, now we've established that. Let's talk about marijuana, if you'd like to. You know what I'm saying? In other words, it's really a matter with a tempter of finding, you know, what is the button I have to push or the box I have to check in order to get past the inhibition because that's all it is. It's not a conscience issue. If God says it's wrong, my friend, it ought to be a matter of conscience. God says, no, they're blessed. Then it needs to be a matter of, well, God wants this and I'm really concerned with aligning myself with Him and so I want it too. A lot of times we as believers serve on the basis of permission or we do wrong on the basis of permission. Like, oh, I can't get away with that. Parents, don't accept that kind of obedience from your children. When you see in your children obedience that is merely external, seek for the obedience of the heart. Nurture the obedience of the heart. You say, Pastor, how do I do that? Well, it's really complicated. I don't know how, but you should do that. Okay. Now, that's, that's, that's too long of a question to answer, but that, that's what you ought to accept. Any leadership. And if you're a leader, listen, you don't want compliance uh, on the basis of what a person can get away with. You want somebody that really wants to do what they're supposed to do. Because I guarantee you, what they can do, they will do. And that's what Balaam is a good example. Let's finish up looking at that example. Okay, so then, in verse 22, the Bible says, And God's anger was kindled because he went. Now, is God an unreasonable God that says, Go do this, and then gets mad because you did? Is that, way, is that the way God works? See, if you think that, and some people do, if you think that, you've got a terrible notion about God and His character. That God is sitting up in heaven, He's some kind of cosmic spectator, playing silly games with people and their hearts and their emotions, and saying, well, do this. No, don't do this. Do this. Don't do this. And then getting angry with you for doing what he said. God did not say to Balaam, I want you to do this. God said to Balaam, I absolutely, under no terms, am okay with you doing this. And Balaam said, well, what about if I did it under these terms? And God said, well, go for a donkey ride. I'll show you something. <laughs> Look at verse 23, uh, 22. Uh, it says, Now he was riding upon his ass, it's a word for donkey, and his two servants were with him, and the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. It doesn't say hands, so that picture's wrong. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. Okay, so you notice that he's going along and the donkey goes into the field. So the, the two rocks are wrong too. You know, he's passing between the rocks. So it just ruins the picture for me when I read the Bible. Too bad I couldn't read when I was a toddler or I'd have gotten it right and not had to deal with this wrong image in my head all my life. Okay, but, oh well, you know what? Our past is our past and we just have to leave it behind us if we can. Moving forward. <laughs> the Bible says in verse 24, But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards and a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. So there was, you know, a wall, but it wasn't a rock. And then the Bible says, when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself onto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And he smote her again. So she hurt his foot. And I've ridden donkeys and they do this. So I do, I do feel for Balaam at this stage of the game with his amount of information. I was riding a donkey one time and it tried to rub me off on a fence. And I, I smote it. I'll be honest with you. Verse 26. The angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And now we get down to the narrow place. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? I'm pretty sure that's the voice that she used. We know that she was female and that she spoke with a, you know, that sort of a, uh, a tone. So, verse 29. And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there a sword in my hand, for now would I kill thee. He's mad. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass, upon whom thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, he bowed down his head, and fell flat 
on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. See, that was the problem with Balaam. He had a perverse way. Perverse way. The word perverse we use in our term in our in our uh, day and age, and we use it really for just twisting anything from what it ought to be. Uh, I don't think there's any need to elaborate on the term, but it's a good term. It's a good way of expressing it because what Balaam did was perverted the truth that he had. In other words, he was willing to just take it and just move it or manipulate it or twist it to something different than what God intended. And he was perfectly happy if he could thwart God's eternal plan. And the silly thing about that, friend, is that he couldn't, actually. I mean, he couldn't bless people God said were cursed, and he couldn't curse people God said were blessed. But he persisted in trying to do so, and hear me now, and partly succeeded in doing so. If you were to read chapter 24, and you ought to, it's a great, it's a great story. Every time he looks at a direction to curse uh, Israel, God gives him a blessing for it. And out of his mouth, he, he told, he made the deal with Balak. He said, "I'll, I'll come, and I'll try." But whatever God tells me to say, I'll say. And everything God told him to say was a blessing for Israel and a curse to those that oppose them. <coughs> and it's a wonderful story of really the way that you can't thwart God's eternal plan. You can't stop God. You can't resist God. At least you can't succeed in resisting God. And yet Balaam did, to a degree, succeed. And how did he do it? Well, simply as explained in the Scripture, that he figured out a way to take a people who God blessed and get them to mess up. The Scripture doesn't give the detailed explanation, but it indicates very, very plainly in the New Testament. And we know actually from writers like, historic writers like Josephus, etc., that what Balaam suggested to the enemies of Israel was that you just send them your beautiful daughters, get the men to marry the daughters, and get the women to talk the men into worshiping their idols, and then God would have to judge them. And so that's what they did. That's what the Midianites did. That's what all the different <coughs> individuals did. And... Um, you see an, an account of it right away where Moses deals with it. And you see Phineas actually uh, killing uh, a, a man who had brought a woman into the camp right after they'd warned against it. So they just got him to sin. They got him to turn their hearts away. That's what happened to King Solomon, if you'll recall. That's what happened to most of the kings of Israel, actually, was that they married women who worshipped idols. And because of that being unequally yoked, relationship, they had their hearts turned away from God. The method worked and it became known as the Balaam method. I know that the scripture doesn't describe it that way, but that's actually what it is. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of destroying nations, actually. It's a way that people who hate or are against a nation use. I don't want to get political about it. I'm not being political, but I'm just telling you the socialist used to try to fight, but they're usually cowards. Now what socialists do is get into the educational systems and train children. Or they just affect the people's thinking, and when they affect the people's thinking, then you're no longer a threat to socialism as they see it. Our, our colleges and universities in the United States of America are full of Marxists and socialists. 
who don't go into the political realm, they go into the educational system and train the people who go into the political realm. That's what's happening in our nation, our country. Uh, I, if, I, if I'm a parent or grandparent or an aunt or an uncle, I wouldn't send uh, my children to any public institution. I know there's good people. There are some good people that are involved in those institutions, but I'll just tell you, I wouldn't send my kids to any of those institutions because they're going to be taught socialism. They are. That's a fact. You don't believe it, check it out, and you will believe it. That's a Balaam method. He got the patent on it. We just don't use his name very often. I'd like to, if you would please, just like to look at a couple of New Testament scriptures where this is plainly illustrated. The first one being 2 Peter 2 and verse 15. There are a lot more you could read. In the Old Testament, you could read about how Balaam was slain. He was actually killed in Numbers 31.8 or 31.16 or Joshua 13 and verse 22. Uh, we will read those scriptures this evening. Second Peter chapter 2, if you found it, look at verse 15. Uh, this is just a description of the fallen angels and of the, uh, or, I'm sorry, of the people who are coming into the church and teaching false doctrine. The Bible says this, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. So what was Balaam's sin? What well, was his willingness to do wrong in spite of knowing what was right? And that's precisely what a false teacher in the church is. You know, false teachers in the church are very difficult to spot. Uh, and it's because they really only do what they can get away with. Sometimes you find out what somebody will do when you when their chains are taken off or their restrictions are taken off, and they'll do as much as they can. Uh, I don't need I don't have time to illustrate that, so let's let's move forward. If you want to ask me about it, I could discuss it with you on an individual level. Verse eleven of Jude. Go to Jude and go to verse eleven. This is speaking of individuals who are are uh, teaching false doctrine in the church. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Well, that was one of our good examples of a bad example, wasn't he? And ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cori. Now, remember this about Balaam as well. What was his motivation? Was, did Balaam have a cause Something he wanted to defend or fight for? Was there a flag for Balaam? He wasn't a part of really either nation. He didn't have a dog in that race. You see what I'm saying? He didn't have, he didn't have something to gain. He didn't have something to lose, except he did have something to gain. What enticed Balaam was riches. The Bible calls it the wages of unrighteousness. In other words, wages of unrighteousness doesn't mean that the gold and the silver he would have gained were wicked gold and silver. It was the pay for doing wickedness. And Balaam was perfectly willing to do anything for wickedness. Wicked people will say something like this. Everybody has their price. You ever heard that? Everybody has their price. And what they think is that it's just a matter of figuring out what the price is and then negotiating terms. Can you hear me? Can I say something to you? If you agree with God, there's no price. There's nothing, there's nothing that you'll take. There's nothing you can, be, you can be paid. If you're Balaam, yeah, you've got a price. You pay enough and he'll do anything he can. You know something, friend? You and I need to have morals. And our morality needs to be based in simply on the simple character of God. What does God think about it? And if God is for it, 
then I'm for it. That's how I think. And if God's against it, then I'm against it. That's how I ought to think. But you know, a lot of people, they'll change their thinking, won't they? I watch pastors change their opinion. I don't think it's because they've decided that the information they had was misinformation and they've come up with different conclusions. I think it had to do with this. I believe it was. I don't know the heart of any person, but I've seen it. I've seen guys do things that they said they'd never do. And I think the reason they do it is because of money or because of power or popularity. They've got their price and you shouldn't have a price. Listen, Christian, you oughtn't have a price. It ought to be a, just a determination, right or wrong. I don't care what the pay is. If it's right, I'm going to do it, and I don't care what it costs. If it's wrong, I won't do it, and I don't care what, what I gain. There's nothing to gain in doing wrong. Balaam lost his life in it. One more verse. Go over to Revelation, one page over from Jude. Chapter 2. And uh, <clears throat> this is to the church at Pergamos. And... They really held to the truth, and that's one of the things they were commended for. But in verse 14, the Bible says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now notice this. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. What was the sin of Balaam? Balaam had a price. He was willing to sin for the reward of iniquity. What was the sin of Balaam? Balaam taught the wicked how to make a stumbling block, put something in front of the Israelites that would cause them to sin and thereby lose God's blessing. See, Balaam couldn't curse Israel. God wouldn't allow it. Balaam couldn't do anything about God's blessing for Israel. But Balaam had a clever plan. He said, Balak, here's what you do. Get them to commit fornication. Get them to fall into idolatry. And God will have no choice but to judge them. In Balaam's defense, that was pretty clever. Wasn't it? I mean, if you're a guy and you're given a riddle, how do you get a people that God's blessed to have God's judgment? The answer is, you can't. And yet, Balaam actually did. He couldn't speak words of cursing. He could only speak words of blessing. But he taught the people how to get around God's blessing. What a wicked thing to do. Balak, Balaam ended up being killed. He met his demise. It was a tragic thing. It was a sad thing. Particularly considering that he was a man who was privileged to actually know who God was and have God speak to him. That's a privilege, isn't it? And yet, in spite of that privilege, Balaam was willing to go against God. And ultimately, Balaam taught the people to make a stumbling block to cause Israel to sin. He had a talking donkey too, but that's not really the point. The point is that Balaam's a good example of a bad example because he was willing to go against God's plan and because he advised the wicked how to get God's people to sin. And that's a good example of a bad example. Father, thank You for what we've learned this evening. I pray that You would help us to absorb it. God, Your Word makes a lot out of this account. It's mentioned over and over and over again as a good example of a bad example. And so, God, we would be remiss, we would be foolish not to really let sink into our heart what the sin of Balaam was and to really ask for Your help, Your Spirit, to examine us and to show us traces of our willingness to do wrong if we could get away with it, and our willingness to go against your plan for reward. And so I pray that you would protect us now, teach us these truths, and help us to profit by them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for your attention tonight. Sorry I went so long. Uh, you're dismissed.